All right, folks. Well, thank you everyone for uh, for joining me this uh, morning or afternoon or evening or wherever it may be if you're uh, if you're not here in person. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about building a purple team capability in a large organization. So we're going to cover the why, the who, the when, the how, and uh, you know, and a little bit about the the what as well. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I, I got a beautiful introduction there. My name is Milos. Um, I've been with uh, RBC for a number of years now. I'm a distinguished engineer and senior director at this organization. I joined about six years ago uh, when the idea of building out a red team was just an idea on a whiteboard. Um, and I've kind of brought that to fruition and built a, I'd like to think a fairly robust capability. We have about 12 red teamers. Um, since my tenure there, I've also built a, a capability to uh, do threat hunting in the organization. I'm sorry, I've taken on a team that's done threat hunting and I've built that team out in the last year and a half. I have a dedicated development team and an agile team that oversees all of that. Um, any of my team members, if they're watching, uh, I'm very happy to work with all of you. So I'm very lucky to, uh, to work with an incredible group of people who are uh, adept at what they do and really um, on the side of innovation. From a background perspective, I spent about uh, almost uh, eight or nine or so years in consulting. So I've got a, lot, got a reasonable amount of exposure, public sector, private sector, small organizations, and large organizations. Um, and I mentioned I'm at RBC, so that makes me Canadian. Uh, so if I have a weird accent, you know a little bit why. Um, we don't say about, that's not actually true, um, but we, we say about that's a little different. Um, for a little bit of context, um, RBC is an organization that is 97,000 people in size. So it's a fairly sizable organization. We are the ninth largest bank in the world. Uh, we process a ton of money. Um, our security team is about 700 people in size. So uh, probably bigger than most organizations as a whole, but hey, we're a bank and, and we're regulated. Um, so before we kind of kick things off and get into the detail about how we build these programs out, I want to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of uh, nomenclature and definition. So uh, to me, purple teaming, quite simply, is the process of improving resilience to cyber attack through pragmatic offensive and defensive collaboration, right? Um, and that is very open to interpretation in terms of what that means. And that's the way I like it, because I don't think that it's very easy to do purple teaming wrong as long as you're abiding by those high level principles. And the goal of our purple team program in general is to increase our capability to detect, protect, and respond to cyber attacks through improvement of people, process, and technology. So yes, a lot of purple teaming involves you know, testing things like Antonio just mentioned with our procedures um, and assessing how our control stack responds, but portions of that may also be related to how our people respond or how we can improve our processes to ensure that the that, that response process or the detection or investigation process is improved. Um, and the way that we're going to structure this talk today is about the road to purple, right? So this will document a little bit about my journey building out this program in my organization, things that I've learned from my peers, um, and uh, and things that I've, I've liked to kind of try out into the future or, or, or ideations that I think are valuable. So we'll kind of start from things in the beginning. And uh, imagine yourself as being someone in a large organization who's decided that, hey, purple teaming is valuable. Um, I think we want to drive and develop this capability in the organization. You know, what's next, right? Well, First, we'll talk about how most people get there, right? How do we get to this idea of uh, wanting to create a purple teaming capability? The first way may be that you have an existing red team and you've ran this red team, for example, like myself for a number of years, and you find that there are certain really valuable components about running a red team operation or a red team capability in the org, but there's also some downsides. The biggest downsides are time to drive pragmatic change. Uh, in a large organization such as ours, if we're running a full end-to-end -end campaign, I think the longest red team op we've ran was around 10 months. Um, that's a long time to go from discovery of some activities. And certainly if there's critical discoveries that we have, we'll, we'll make sure that those things are remediated or mitigated accordingly before we move on. But uh, it's a long time to actually drive change in the environment. So you start thinking about, well, how can we do something like this a little quicker? How can we drive a little bit more pragmatic results uh, in our organization? So that might be one component of how you got here, so to say. And the other one might be that you're in an organization that doesn't have a red team capability. You have uh, maybe some standard offense services, some AppSec stuff, some SaaS, some DAST, uh, some pen testing work that you're doing. And you're looking at expanding that capability. And you're thinking to yourself, OK, well, what do we do now? Do we want to build a purple team? first or do we want to build a red team first and i've had this conversation asked to me a couple or this question asked to me a couple of times is you know what do you do if you haven't built either and you're doing it in 2022 do you build your purple team first or do you do you build your red team and that question is answered dependent upon the organization that you're in and the security climate that you're experiencing so for example 
Uh, if you're in an organization where um, the value of purple teaming is pretty obvious to most folks, most leadership folks in the security side of the business, um, then purple teaming may be the way to go because you can realize those improvements to your cybersecurity program much faster. On the other hand, if you're in an organization that thinks that everything is buttoned down really well, you're fairly impervious to attack, uh, you may want to build a red team capability or bring in an external red team to run an operation to level set um, some of the expectations with the folks in your organization, demonstrating that usually for most organizations, security is somewhat porous, right? So there's a there's a good uh, good uh, driver there for for building out this kind of capability. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the initialization obstacles that you may experience in building out this program. You've decided you want to do it. You know there's value. Now your job is basically to do two things in an enterprise. The first one is to convince your executives uh, that they need to support you and that this is valuable. And the next one is to convince your peers that what you're trying to do is valuable not only for you, but also for them and the organization as a whole. So when we talk about the executive support side, uh, generally it's, it's, it's explaining that value proposition of time to pragmatic improvement in the environment. Um, that's enough of a good sell. We'll get into some of the other points of the questions that you might get from a, your executive team, which is, well, why not this? Or we're doing that already. And you know, why, why do we need to add this on top? Um, and then the, the, the resistance or the obstacles that you might have from your peers might be the fact that they all have their own goals and their own motivations. And like most of us in cybersecurity, I think I heard it said like 50 times already today is like, we, we don't have enough time, right? You're already busy doing what you're doing. So um, the first thing is, you know, why not blank? Uh, why don't we do this instead of doing purple teaming? And, you know, one of the things that comes up often is why don't we do pen testing or we already do pen testing? Why do we need to do purple teaming? And the dis differentiator here is, is pretty clear um, for, for those of us that are practitioners and for those of us that aren't. Um, the difference is that pen testing is, is effective at helping us identify vulnerabilities on a set scope of systems or applications or combination thereof. Um, and purple teaming helps us build resilience to cyber attack um, on a broader or more generalized scale. So they don't replace each other, they complement each other really well. So it's a, it's a thing to build out the program and not in, in replace of. Uh, another one I sometimes hear is, well, we do threat modeling. Like, why do we need to do purple teaming? We already do this stuff on a table and we ideate on these things. Why do we need to, uh, to go ahead and do this, you know, in a, in a, in a pragmatic way? Uh, and the classic example that I like to use is, let's say you're doing some kind of threat modeling exercise, you've built out some threat scenarios, you have some attack trees, and, uh, you know, somewhere in your attack tree, you have, you know, threat actor uses this malware to go ahead and get access to this data or move to the system. And uh, if, you, if you've got your threat modeling hat on, you're doing this on paper, you have your set of safeguards, your set of controls, and you, you attack the safeguard of, well, we have EDR on there, and we have anti-malware, and we have all this other stuff, and you mitigate, you know, the viability of that attack path but it doesn't necessarily tell you the reality. I think all of us in this room today, if you said you had antivirus, we probably would be all on the same page to say that you know your antivirus isn't effective at stopping all threat actors from operating on what they're trying to do. So purple teaming allows us to see the real world impacts um, in our organization. Um, the next one that you might hear is, you know, why do purple teaming if we're already doing red teaming? I already touched on this. It's really that time to value proposition around how much time you're gonna invest doing this. Um, but the other component is about the relationships that you can build and, 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 and uh, the skill sets that you can ramp up for folks. And I'll touch on that as well. Um, you may hear some other stuff come at you. You know, we're doing this, we're doing that. Uh, we have these services. We had this assessment done. Um, the reality is, is that as we get into some of the mutual benefits of this program, it'll be pretty evident as to why we want to do this instead of some, or not instead of, but in addition to some of the other activities that we're doing. So we talk about mutual benefit, and this is really about your peers, convincing them that purple teaming is the way to go and it is the way to move forward. Um, the benefits are as follows. Number one, knowledge transfer. And this one cannot be stated enough. Teaching your attackers more about defense and your defenders more about attack creates more well-rounded cybersecurity professionals. At the end of the day, they're all trying to, say, to, to, to solve the same problem, right? I, I, I say this thing, you know, I, I come from a red teaming background. I love the notion of red teaming, but red is blue. Blue is blue, purple is blue. At the end of the day, the goal for all of these teams is to heighten the resilience of an organization to cyber attack, right? Um, so creating that knowledge transfer creates professionals that understand the problem set from both perspectives. And that's incredibly valuable to developing a skill set that is usable on both sides of the fence. So that means that when your defenders are responding to a real world breach, they may have a better insight of what might have happened two or three steps ago, or what might happen two or three steps later based upon what they're coming across because of the experience that they have in understanding the offensive mindset. 
your, your attackers may have a better understanding of how they can look at poking holes in defenses to increase that resilience as you iteratively go through implementing this program. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is that in most mature organizations, you have such a spend in, in what you do from a cybersecurity perspective, and you may have MSSPs and all the controls and all the things um, that exist and are wonderful in the cybersecurity world. So that your defensive team's actual hands-on exposure to material and impactful breach may actually be limited. Purple teaming allows us to do hands-on activities and give them practical experience to use their tools in their real production environment for real, coming across the strengths, the limitations, the weaknesses, um, and the areas of improvement that they have in that control stack or their procedures or their personal skill set. So it allows them to become sharper before they have to do that or discover what that looks like in a, in a real world breach. Um, and there's three things that I wanna talk about as advantages that you have in doing this in an enterprise. Uh, number one is you have money, probably lots of money, which means that you can enable a lot. And as we all know, security is pretty expensive. So that money component will come in handy and we'll, we'll touch on why a little bit later. Uh, people. So you're probably dealing with a large number of people that you can operationalize to build out this program. Um, and that is helpful because, as you know, we're all very busy and we've all got a lot on the go. And lastly, you have a lot of awesome skills. So, for example, uh, to Antonio's point, if you're developing procedures and you want to emulate a specific threat actor and perhaps a loader that they're using, maybe you're going to use your Red Team's uh, you know, Tradecraft research developers to actually recreate that loader for the purposes of a purple team exercise. If the value is there, if it's not, you might not do, but you have the capability to really go deep when you want to. Um, and then you also have like a really big challenge um, and that's scaling. So you have a very large organization, you have a finite number of people that are in this uh, you know, virtual team that you assemble that you call a purple team. How do you actually get this to scale across an organization of 100,000 people, 200,000 people, 500,000 endpoints, a million endpoints, whatever it may be. And, and we'll touch on, on that problem set a little bit in the future. All right, so now we've established in terms of where we are and where we're trying to go. We understand who we need to influence and how we wanna build out the program. The next thing that I wanna talk about really um, are how we can understand the participants and what an overall engagement model might look like. So unsurprising uh, to probably everyone in the audience here, uh, purple team exercise involves red team members and it involves blue team members. It also, I'm discovering now that the uh, font is different on uh, probably a Windows machine than it is on a Mac um, for my asset. So uh, I apologize that some of the text will be, uh, will be off, uh, off size there. But uh, in addition to our red team and our blue team, you have sponsors and you have observers. So sponsors, perhaps unsurprisingly, are your executive audience. They're the ones that enable this kind of activity to happen. Um, they're obviously the ones that you're going to feed a lot of the results of this activity back up to. So socialization is very important, especially in a large organization, because if you can't socialize, you can't uh, make the value clear. Um, oftentimes things may go uh, defunded or, 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 or a bit stale. You also have observers. These may be folks that are somewhat involved in the purple team exercise um, or, 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 or activity, um, but they may just be involved passively. So from a learning perspective, maybe they're new analysts in the SOC. Maybe there's some folks on the TI team. Maybe there's some folks over in your audit side that want to learn a little bit more about what tactical cybersecurity looks like. Now, because you're in a large organization though, your blue team might actually consist of a lot of different team members. It could be your security operations, your incident response. It could be control owners. You may have specific people who are responsible for security control owners in your environment. You may even have application owners if you're testing some app specific uh, stuff. You may have SMEs that are subject matter experts of specific um, areas in your environment, uh, how they operate, what's important to those areas. And your red teamers might be blue teamers and your blue teamers might be red teamers. And this is really important, I think, again, about building out that skill set and that rounded knowledge. Sometimes you want to put your, your offensively minded folks over on the defensive side, help guide them through some of that investigatory process and kind of share that information with them and the opposite on the, on the defensive side. So from an approach perspective, I, I think this is all pretty straightforward. Um, wow, that text is really bad. Um, terrible. I wish I would have known that was the case. Um, Note for next time, PDFs only. Um, so from an approach perspective, we're going to do some planning and preparation. We're going to execute um, some sort of stuff in our environments. Um, we're going to go ahead and look at how we can analyze that and improve in our environment. And then we have an outputs uh, component, and then we have a lessons learned. So that's pretty straightforward. Let's dig into each one of these phases as they relate to building this out in a larger organization. So um, Planning and preparation is critical to a successful purple teaming exercise or, or program in general. 
Um, so number one, you want to define the objectives. What are you actually trying to get done as part of this purple team exercise? Are you testing things at random or is there some sort of systemic thing that you're trying to root out or understand? Um, this could be a goal. This could be a vision of what you're trying to develop. It's having some sort of alignment to understand, hey, what are the bounds within this, this, uh, this specific activity that we're focusing on? You're probably going to do some threat intel collection and analysis. I'm not going to go too much into detail about that because if you were here uh, just in the last uh, hour, Antonio went through a lot of that in detail about what uh, threat intel collection and analysis looks like for doing purple teaming. But suffice to say, you're going to be working very closely with your threat intel team to root out those specific procedures, if that's what you're looking to do, uh, tactics or techniques, understand trends, um, and distill that into a set of um, TTPs or more, more accurately procedures that you're going to be executing during this exercise. Uh, obviously, you may have to do some preparation to do that as well. You're not just going to be able to pick them out of the ether and run them. You may have to build some of this yourself. You may have to assume some of this because um, to some of the points earlier, not all of the threat intel that we want is always there. Often there's gaps and we have a part of the campaign that we know about and a part that we don't. Being in an enterprise organization, chances are that you have the capability to purchase some very expensive threat intel that does give you that procedural level. But it doesn't take away... Um, the fact that it still takes a lot of time to weed through that data, to pull out those details, to reassemble them. And I think the, the real win that we can get is A, visibility into those procedures and B, uh, a better way to actually collect them at, at, through different lenses of interest. Uh, but at any rate, once we build those out, uh, we create a schedule and uh, a plan, and we, then we go ahead and distribute that. The schedule is imperative. Um, why? Because while we're working with potentially seven, eight, nine, ten different teams to collaboratively execute on this activity. If you don't have a schedule and you don't tell people how much time they're going to be accountable for, those two weeks you forecasted for sure are going to turn into three months and the exercise is going to be a bit of a challenge. So uh, tr trust me, we've learned this the hard way. Um, you want to create a good schedule, tell people how much time they're going to need to commit to and tell them uh, when that time is going to be there. Distribute that plan to everybody, get everyone in alignment, thumbs up, and then you can move towards execution. So um, execution, really, you can start with a tabletop discussion where you sit down and you go through what you're going to execute in the environment. What are the specific procedures? Why do they matter? What's the greater context of things? This is valuable to understand baseline expectation alignment with your practitioners and what happens in the real world. It's important to know, for example, that if everyone on your team thinks all of this is going to get detected, but none of it does, that you have a big delta between what your perceived capabilities are versus what your actual capabilities are. And you want to improve that that delta as best as you can, because of course, these practitioners are the ones that feed information back up to your executive audience. That is at the end of the day, spending that security spend every single year on, on uh, new capabilities or new programs. Um, and this is also very helpful for your defenders, especially your more junior defenders to ask questions like, why does this procedure matter? Why would someone do this? Why is this, you know, why would a threat actor do this kind of activity? And sitting with the red team allows them to actually take that in and understand a little bit more of that that um, thought process around this so that you're not just firing things off and executing them to defenders that don't have context around what you're actually trying to do. Um, and then the execution component is perhaps, uh, I guess, in theory, the most simple, right? You, you execute a procedure, um, you go ahead and you do analysis of that, and then you kick that off to detection or protection engineering uh, if you need to. If you find that, hey, where our visibility around that is exactly where we want it to be, awesome. We note that down and we kind of move on to the next thing. It's important to note that the detection and protection engineering can work in parallel. This doesn't have to be a, you know, a sequential type activity. So you can kick off a bunch of things and fork them off to others to drive improvement. So our outputs and our lessons learned side, we prepare and distribute deliverables. I'm not going to go into the details of those. Maybe in your organization, it's a PowerPoint. Maybe it's an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe it's an 80-page Word document. You have to understand the security culture in your organization and who you want to drive influence and change with. If you don't have good, solid buy-in from your defensive teams and they need to better understand the value of this, write more so that they can read more and understand the context of the value. If you're all on the same page and you've done this for a couple of years, then yeah, you can probably just throw things into an Excel spreadsheet or a Confluence page and move on with the next exercise. What you never want to kind of skimp out too much though is socialization with the executive audience to show them the actual change you're driving in the org. So uh, purple teams tell a great story because they're like, hey, we, we did a bunch of stuff. We found a bunch of problems and we fixed most of them and the rest of these we're still working on in the long term to fix out. So unlike red teams, which are like, we found a lot of problems and the executive's natural question, of course, is always and anyone who, who would be leading a team is, all right, now that we found them, what are we doing about these things and how are we driving change? 
Um, you may aggregate the data for trending and analysis. I think the MITRE ATT&CK framework has been mentioned a bunch of times. I highly recommend that as a, as a kind of central basis of discussion when you're doing these kind of activities um, and aggregating that data back to heat map. Uh, and, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, and then implement any lessons learned that you have for, uh, for improvement. So you'll find absolutely when it comes to planning, prep, and execution, there's something you could have done better. So iteratively, as you go through these exercises, um, go through that process and improve to get better. All right, we're getting a little closer to building that robust and, and evolving uh, Purple Team program. We know the basic execution. And the thing I wanna talk about now is who should drive what activities and presenting some possible engagement models, some of which are traditional and some of which are a little bit more esoteric or experimental in nature. Um, who should drive Purple Team activities? Uh, it's hard to say that like anyone is wrong to drive this activity as long as it's founded on, on realistic need. Um, and some sort of uh, rationale. Um, a lot of times blue team can drive uh, the need for purple team. They may be getting hit by a campaign that's really taking up a lot of their time. Perhaps it's not getting you know, meaningful impact on the organization with respect to objective achievement, but it's chewing up a lot of their resources and doesn't allow them to view, uh, to, to spend their time in other areas. Uh, maybe it's you know uh, some sort of phishing based stuff. Maybe it's attachments that are landing in the environment. Those are great inputs to define as objectives for Purple Team exercise, collect the appropriate threat intel, ideate on that with everyone and build a, a, an exercise that's catered towards that. Um, it may also be from your threat intelligence. They may say, hey, there's a new threat actor or there's recent activity of a threat actor that we've been monitoring as part of uh, you know our, 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 our higher priority items. And we want to assess what those actions in our environment may look like in case we were to be targeted by this threat actor. Um, and lastly, uh, you may have red team insights from exercises where you've identified obvious visibility gaps and you want to improve in those spaces further than what you've done um, in the red team exercise and a uh, red team operation. And I think that's one of the things that I, I kind of always like to to touch on purple team versus red is that you know in a red team, if you if you imagine the MITRE attack framework, like you kind of traverse like one path. Through that, through that matrix, right? And maybe you kind of back up and, and you go a little bit between, between a number of tactics, but you really have a finite understanding. Here we have the opportunity to go, hey, you know what, that technique or that tactic was problematic for us. Maybe it's lateral movement, right? You found that you're running a bunch of Windows boxes. There's you know, N plus one ways to, to laterally move from a Windows box to another. You want to do a purple team exercise that's focused on fleshing out you know, that visibility around lateral movement for that specific area in your environment or those platforms in your environment. All right, a little bit about engagement models. Um, so we'll kind of run through these fairly quickly. Um, we'll talk about some traditional ones and some, some more experimental ones. Um, so this is perhaps your, your most obvious way to run a purple team exercise end to end, and this is campaign emulation. So um, we have some threat intel data that we collect on threat actors of interest. Uh, we go ahead and assemble that. We distill it to some TTPs that we want to execute. Um, we create the execution planning and scheduling. We prep as, as we need to. So on the red team side, that, mean, that might mean C2 prep. It might mean infrastructure structure prep, it might be custom code development um, for specific activities, and um, we're ready to execute. Execution follows basically the same process that I've outlined in the past, so I won't talk about the two too much, and outputs um, are the process of reviewing, distributing deliverables, socializing with your stakeholders, um, and then long-term tracking uh, of that activity. Um, the next thing that you might want to do is, or in the next engagement model that you might want to do is the selective TTP analysis. Um, so in this scenario, you may have input coming in from your threat intel team, your blue team, your red team, uh, could come from the business, could really come from anyone that says, hey, we have a need for more visibility in this space. It's not going to be mapped to a specific threat actor. It might be mapped to a class of threat actors or a certain sophistication level. Um, but this is an area that we want to poke in on. So I think that classic example of lateral movement, uh, one of the core things that I always focus on I, that I call like semi-permanent objectives in our environment or initial access lateral movement uh, privilege escalation uh, because that is pretty common to almost every single breach that we see. So if you're kind of focusing on those areas, there's value um, regardless of, of one specific instance. Execution looks very much so the same as we have in the past. Uh, for those of you, if you're taking any notes, I'm happy to make these available, the slides. Um, I'll, I can shoot them up on Discord. I'll put them up on my GitHub so you've got access to them um, and I'll fix this, this terrible font misalignment because it drives me nuts. Um, so the next one that's kind of, that's, it's been interesting and we, we've done this one internally is this no, notion of guided exploration. And, and this could maybe be like a quasi overt red team activity, but you might do some threat modeling and some analysis. You, you define some sort of objectives that you want to focus on from a purple team exercise. Maybe it's an area in your environment. Maybe it's a certain action or impact happening in your environment. It's some area to go on, but 
you really don't have solid threat intel to go on, or you don't have examples of this happening in the past, right? A, a great example about this, talk about where we lack procedures is like advanced operations in the cloud, right? If you're trying to find threat intel about like advanced, you know, APT style attacks in the cloud and procedure level, like good luck. I think pretty much like it's it's very it's very sparse. Um, we're not seeing a lot of it. There's not a lot of disclosure that's happening in that space. So you kind of have to ideate on things a little bit yourself. So you can have some idea by creating this ideation and planning of an attack path, but instead of prescribing what you're going to do, you explore through the environment. So the execution here looks like your red team actually operating in a non-covert or non-clandestine style fashion with your blue team there along with them. They're in the same chat. They could be sharing a WebEx session as they go through this process and they're trying to find <clears throat> meaningful ways to move through the environment or to achieve on those objectives. So in this way, we're purple teaming, but we're not actually prescribing what the specific procedures or attack plan will look like. Uh, that again can be kicked out for analysis and then detection or protection engineering um, and improvement as we need to. Um, and then the outputs, very similar. I'm not gonna repeat that process. Um, the last one that we might have here that's quite interesting is this notion of a planted breach. So instead of actually going ahead and saying, here's what we're going to run, um, the, red the red team goes and seeds a breach inside of the environment, right? So they research maybe a threat actor of interest or, or an attack campaign of interest, where they use that as source of inspiration to create an active breach that's happening in the organization. You may want to save some time and not have the red team go through the process of actually doing all of this for real. Maybe you give them access. They drop on the assets, they put malware implants, they start staging some data collection, they create a breach that's maybe say 60, 70% of the way through. And then what you can actually do is you can create threat intelligence that you would distribute to your security operations center um, as you normally would for threat intelligence and seed this into the normal consumption platform for that team. Um, and they can know that this is, you know, part of a purple team exercise. They don't have to not know, but it emulates the full chain of information collection and dissemination all the way through detection, response, eradication, containment, and eradication. So the execution here is the process of the blue team actually going through and hunting for this campaign in their entire environment, identifying the links between the different assets from that seed material that they had in the threat intel data. Um, and that allows them to kind of... Um, exercise not only their hands-on keyboard experience with their tool set and their processes that they have, but also their creative thinking and investigatory uh, skills in terms of saying, hey, you know, we have this, we know this is here. What else can we identify that this branch may, or that this breach may exist in the environment? <clears throat> and that's very helpful to engage your blue team in something that's a little bit more um, challenging than, uh, than, than technique execution. And then you have your outputs, which I'm not going to go through again. Um, and that brings us a little bit closer. So now we've gone from this idea of, you know, wanting to build a purple team program, knowing who we need to influence, general approach, who the players are, what are some sample engagement models, and, and going back to that, like, you can't do it wrong. Like, if you find other ways to do this, and they work for your organization, and they're driving pragmatic change, awesome, keep doing that. These are just some food for thought, or examples of how you can engage. But there's one thing that I want to touch on, and I've mentioned the word resilience a couple of times. And the purpose of a purple team, in my opinion, is to increase cyber resilience in an organization. And that to me is defined by the capability of an organization to not prevent attack, but to withstand attack. That means the organization gets attacked. That happens, you observe it, you understand, you respond to that accordingly, and you're able to maintain business outcomes near perfectly. And that's a big kind of step away from just thinking about making things secure, right? The reality is, as we know, right, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make things 100% secure. So how do we build resilience? So <clears throat> if purple teaming builds resilience, there's a big limitation here. Human only purple teaming tests a limited number of items at specific points in time, right? So we can see part of the iceberg, but we're missing a much broader picture. So while it gives us that notion of more pathways through the MITRE attack framework, doing it with people exclusively is very expensive and very time consuming. Um, I work in an organization that can maybe have a purple team of 30 people. Most organizations don't have a purple team, don't have a security team of 30 people. So we have to think of how can we, you know, split 80-20 and find a way to drive this effectively. Um, and that gets us back to that initial problem that we kind of ignored, which is this notion of scaling. Um, and I think that the best way that we can approach this uh, inside of large organizations is, is through automation. 
And that may be unsurprising. And uh, for those of you that it's not surprising, hopefully some of the outputs of that automation will be, will be insightful and surprising. So there's, there's two ways that we can kind of really do this. One, we can codify TTPs for continuous assessment. So that's to say that as we do these, as we execute these procedures inside of our purple team, uh, we go ahead and we throw them into some automation layer so that we can go ahead and continuously execute them in the environment for two purposes. One is to validate that um, our security posture, or the things that we implemented from a detection perspective are working. And over time, as those things stop to work, and they will stop to work, that we can go ahead and go back to those and improve. And the main reason why certain things may stop working from a detection or protection perspective is that while the technique stays the same, the procedures change so drastically that they're no longer effective uh, or sorry, that the existing defensive or protective controls are no longer effective at preventing those procedures. So that continuous assessment or continuous analysis allows us to catch that very early on and identify what's happening. It may also catch something where like you made a config change and things just broke and it's not supposed to work that way, right? Um, and then once we start codifying those TTPs, uh, we can also start augmenting our exercises with automation to begin with. So um, we're not just gonna be running things hands on keyboard manually. And the one thing that I would say, if you're building this program out, I really do strongly encourage you to at the start, run things on keyboard hands on manually because that lets your blue team sit with you, understand what the offensive team is doing, understand how they're thinking, under opportunities to ask questions. If we run this through automation right away, there's still a lot of questions that happen on the defensive side that, we're, that we can't answer very well. So. Um, here's what this kind of looks like, uh, maybe fleshed out a little bit better. So you have your inputs, which could be your purple team exercises, your threat intelligence, research that you're seeing in the public, your red team operations, um, all resulting into this curation of a TTP set that you can execute in an autom automated uh, me method in your organization. So um, I'm, I've talked about how purple teaming can be helped with this, but the one thing that we want to remember is that we don't have to constrict this input for codifying TTPs to only purple team exercises. Indeed, every red team operation that you do, TTPs that can be codified at the end of that exercise should be, or that operation should be dumped into this sort of uh, library to, to curate. Purple team exercises, same thing. Interesting threat intel that comes in that's relevant to your organization, same. Public research that you're seeing about procedures that may or may not be applicable to your environment, dump it all in there. And then what that allows us to create is an environment where we can execute these procedures or techniques or tactics or whatever you want to call it um, in an automated way. We can also automate the data collection. So Antonio alluded to the notion of building some capability to reach into your SIM, reach into your EDR logs, reach into your e ingress, egress points, wherever you may need to pull data in to, in an automated mechanism, understand whether you have detection. Um, and that automates result collection, which can then drive further analysis that we need to do. The output of this is different. It's a continuously updated data set that allows for, I think, a really uh, novel understanding of cybersecurity inside of an organization. And uh, what that really comes down to is that you're generating a data set that's objective. So it's not my opinion on whether something works or doesn't. It's whether it worked or it didn't uh, on some assets that you've tested on and empirically derived. And I love that idea because one of the things that we suffer from a lot in security is subjective analysis, right? Everyone has an opinion. I come from an offense background. I always think that things are more brittle and porous than they really are. And people from a defensive background always come from the notion of, well, you can't do that. That shouldn't be possible. And then things are possible. So this for the most part, removes the human uh, elements out of uh, this, this data collection process. And I'm not saying we should ignore people entirely, but I'm saying that we should augment their decision-making with this data set to make them more accurate at what they're doing. So obviously here you can do some maturity and you can do some trending analysis to tell you about, you know, things are getting better, things are getting worse, and you'll probably see a little bit of that, you know, as things move along. But what's more interesting is that you can take this data set and you can start doing threat centric analysis. So for example, you have this massive data set on all these TTPs that you're testing or inside of your environments. And you know, you may have uh, you know, some sort of detection here or protection there. You can zoom that out and you can say, okay, well, what does that look like per technique? So if I have 50 procedures that map to one technique, that's a pretty good confidence interval, assuming that I have a good spread of sophistication 
in those in those procedures, it's a pretty good confidence interval that if if it says, hey, I have 83% detection there, you know, 76% protection, I have some pretty good understanding of where I sit with respect to that technique being executed in my environment. You can step back and you can look at that from a tactic level, map that back to kill chain and start understanding, hey, you know, are all of our best capabilities all the way at the end of the attack chain? And do we want to shift that left potentially, or do we want to build that throughout? Um, and where I think it gets even neater is that you can start overlaying specific questions and you could say, hey, you know, uh, APT, blah, 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 or, you know, UNC, whatever is now of interest to my organization. Well, is there procedures that I can pick out from my library or at the least techniques that I can pick out from my library match to that threat actor sophistication level that allow me to get a resilience insight of our organization against that threat actor in our environment? And that can be sliced and diced a number of different ways. I could probably just talk on this topic forever, so I'm not I'm not going to stay here for too long. But this is a, this is a tremendously exciting component. Um, the other idea is threat modeling um, or or risk analysis. So we all know risk analysis is you know you have some statement of sensitivity, you have a bunch of assets, you have threats, you have vulnerabilities, you risks that materialize. We look at how we can mitigate those those risks, and then we have residual risks that shake out. Well. Both threat modeling and risk analysis is generally dependent upon who's doing it. I always say that if you have four people doing a, you know, a threat risk assessment or a threat modeling exercise, you come up with seven different results. Uh, I don't know how it happens, but it just does. So this allows us to sort of um, calibrate people and object and, and augment their subjective decision making with empirical and objective data. So if, for example, in a threat modeling exercise or in, in a risk scenario, you're trying to say, hey, this attack chain could happen. Well, you can deconstruct that attack chain or, or, or map it back to techniques that are relevant in the, that are relevant to those different discrete actions in your environment, and then start understanding against different sophistication levels, what's our resilience to that actually happening in our environment. What's even more interesting is if you don't do this in a report, but you instead do it in an application, you can dynamically start understanding what is the likely resilience of your organization to attack chains that may happen in your environment. Where it gets even cooler, is that you can start saying, okay, well, of all of these things that we've seen here, if you're doing automated data collection, you know what controls are responding to what. So you can say, hey, um, I understand I've got good resilience here, but what about if my EDR goes dark and I don't have any EDR data? Suddenly your threat landscape and your resilience to activity may shift quite drastically. And you know, we have to surmise that that could happen in a state where you know, we have threat actors that are actively capable of you know, su subverting user mode hooks or injecting their own drivers into, into the kernel and then being able to go ahead and disable that telemetry. So modeling those scenarios where certain controls fail or don't operate or don't have trust, trustworthiness um, is tremendously valuable to understand what resilience looks like on a, on a more agile perspective. Um, when it comes to automation options, there's really kind of three things you can do. Obviously, you can purchase something, you can build it in-house, um, or you can use open source. Um, this depends on your organization and how quickly you want to be able to demonstrate value. I went through this process of thinking about, do we build this in-house? Um, do we go ahead and, and, and purchase something? We ended up going with a commercial solution, just being quite uh, frank, because of the the, it allowed us effectively to stand on the shoulders of others. There's a lot of other work that's been done. Uh, and I kind of like to say that, uh, you know, if I wanted to build a really fast car, would I build my own wheels from the ground up? Would I build my own rubber? Or would I use components um, from other things? So I don't think that this automation solution is the program. I think it's just one of the engines and maybe you want multiple engines that can run that in your environment. Maybe some of it is open source. Maybe some of it's in-house. I think certainly if you're going cloud and you want to do this stuff, a lot of it has to be in-house at this point in time because there aren't good commercial options. Um, but there's pros and cons to, to both op, uh, both options. Uh, sorry, all three options. Um, I'm a big proponent of open source software if you can get it, but oftentimes the library set of procedures is quite limited, which if you don't have a big team to start building that up, may be challenging in your organization or if you don't have the skill set to build it up. Um, and then as we move through this notion of not doing discrete human only based activity, there's some program shift that's going to have to happen. Uh, number one is that you're probably not going to create, you know, PowerPoints and you're not going to create uh, Excel spreadsheets and you're not going to create reports. You're going to start moving towards dynamic output. So you have to start thinking about, do you want to build an in-house web app or use some existing sort of capability to visualize this data in real time um, and give people access to the data in real time as it shifts? Um, also, you may want to rethink how you're doing socialization. So in the past, you might have talked to your executives at the end of every kind of purple team exercise. Well, if you're moving towards this continuous program where you're augmenting a lot with automation, you're probably going to change your socialization to be a little bit more on the key highlights. And you might want to do it on a quarterly basis with executives that, that um, want to have that information or that should have that information. 
And then the last thing to think about is your team structure. So as you move towards automation, um, do you want to have a virtual team that you bring together um, and you, you go ahead and you pull people in from the SOC and you pull people in from your Threat Intel team and you pull people in from your red team to create a purple team? Or do you want to have a dedicated purple team? Right? There's some organizations that have moved to this dedicated space. I think there's definite advantages in terms of efficiency and capability, but there are also some disadvantages in that you're not then bringing in that whole side of blue to be able to engage in these exercises as they might have in the past and use them as learning opportunities to build up their own skill set. So it, it depends on your organization, but definitely something to think about. All right, that brings us almost near the end in terms of where we are. There's a couple of things that I just want to, sorry, in terms of building out um, a robust and, and evolving purple team capability. There's a couple of things I still want to touch on, and that's really around lessons learned. Number one, there is no way um, to do this more effectively than to build strong relationships with the people that are engaging in this activity. That trust that they uh, build between each other, the way that they get to know each other, and the capabilities that they have around operating on offensive and defensive side is invaluable to not only them, but also to the organization that they work for. Uh, secondly, it's hard to do this wrong as long as you remember the outcome being that, hey, you have offensive and defensive pragmatic collaboration, and they are driving pragmatic change inside of your organization. Um, the third would be, we went through a very rapid evolving model of what a purple team program may look like. Uh, this in some organizations or in many organizations takes years. So crawl, walk, run approach. Don't try to do everything at once. Feel free to kind of take it slowly uh, and build it up. And uh, the last one that I would say is that don't stop here or, or, or halfway. I mean, uh, maybe what we're presenting now in five years will be considered you know, uh, useless and as it usually is in cybersecurity, right? We go, what are we thinking five years ago? Um, so think about evolving. If you see the value proposition in your organization start to drop from this kind of activity, think about how you can revamp it. Think about how you can evolve it and think about how you can bring it back up um, to where you need it to be. Well, that's it for me today. Thank you for your time.